Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Bilingualism and Multilingualism. I am Dr. Ark Verma from the Department of Cognitive Sciences at IIT Kanpur. As you know, in this course I am going to talk to you about different aspects of how an individual learns to use multiple languages, what are the different aspects related to it and also try and understand bilingualism more as a phenomena at different levels. There are the neuroscience level, psycholinguistic level, at the level of linguistics to a certain extent, the socio-political and the sociolinguistics aspects of bilingualism as well. In today's lecture, I will talk to you about different classifications and different types of bilingualism that may emerge and certain phenomena that are associated with it. Let us begin. Now, a very interesting aspect of bi or multilingualism and I have said that I am basically going to use these terms interchangeably is the interaction between the languages of the individual. Given that a single individual, a certain uh, person uh, learns two separate languages and as I have discussed in the previous lecture that a language sort of brings with itself an entire system. A language is a system of symbols and rules within a particular, uh, uh, you know, framework. Say for example, Hindi has particular sounds, we sort of combine those sounds to create Hindi words. It has a very specific syntax and basically there is an entire, uh, uh, you know, landscape within which a particular language uh, operates. Now imagine that you are mixing this entire particular lang landscape with the landscape of a different language. Say for example, I am a Hindi English bilingual and I know English sounds as well and I combine those English sounds to create English words, I use the English syntax to create English sentences. So what really is happening in my head probably is that both of these sort of independent or uh, you know bona fide uh, language systems will certainly find ways to interact with each other because they are being executed by the same person or if I may use the metaphor they are housed in the same brain. So one of the very interesting aspects of bilingualism is basically to try and understand how the two languages of an individual interact with each other. How does, a, uh, how does an individual, let us say, control or modify this interaction between his or her two languages? For example, it is quite common for bilinguals to code switch. It is quite common for bilinguals basically to use two languages while speaking uh, sometimes with the same person if he knows that the person knows both of these known languages. I often switch between Hindi and English when I am talking to my students because I understand that they speak or understand both Hindi and English. This is very interesting because uh, for the one it is uh, interesting in the sense that the single speaker can continue to speak in one language without the interference of the other but when he or she decides he can actually create something of a code mixed uh, language wherein we are using words of Hindi using the English uh, using the syntax of English or the words of English using the syntax of Hindi and that is if you see and look around has uh, commonly been referred to as Hinglish which a lot of uh, you know uh, people of this generation speak. So the interaction between the two languages happens at two different at uh, several different levels uh, some of which are the sounds uh, so, uh, the other is the words you know we con constantly keep borrowing words from the languages that we know and also at the level of syntax as I said it is quite common that people who know two or more languages intermix or interchangeably use the syntax of either of the languages that they know. So, in a sense basically what is happening and what happens uh, you know after uh, a certain point of time when, in, when an individual has sort of picked up these languages is that both of these languages start influencing each other to a certain extent or they continue influencing each other to a certain extent and for psycholinguistics or uh, it is a very interesting question as to what really happens uh, in an individual's linguistic behavior and their linguistic choices when they are sort of using uh, the two languages at the same time or say for example when they are using these two have been using these two languages for a larger period of time. 
Now, an interesting question therefore arrives is are these languages that an individual learns very similar to each other or they are different to each other? That brings us to the concept of linguistic diversity. Now, the concept of linguistic diversity is, is interesting to understand before we start with the annals of bilingualism is because we need to understand what is the nature of these systems that we are proposing interact. Are the languages pretty much identical copies of each other in the sense that although the words and the sounds may be different, but the system of uh, putting together the uh, sounds into words or words into sentences is pretty much the same. Does that really happen? Are the languages actually identical to each other? Or uh, as some might say that there are these different languages in the world. India alone probably houses more than 2000 different languages and across the world there might be tens of thousands of different languages, some of which are known and studied while some uh, are still understudied and people are discovering new languages uh, and some languages are sort of uh, you know dying off because the speakers are, uh, you know, there are very few speakers that speak those languages anymore. So, this question is, is, is interesting to ponder because uh, once you start looking at the behavior of a bilingual, you would also need to understand a little bit about the systems that we are talking about. So, the concept of linguistic diversity basically states that there are, while there are several different languages in the world, they might be very similar to each other as far as the overall framework is concerned. They may seem to sort of be based upon very similar rules, very common rules and this is an idea that is not a very new idea, it has been proposed earlier as well and one of the key proponents of this idea has been Noam Chomsky, a well-known uh, linguist who has given the concept of what is referred to as universal grammar. Now, Chomsky's concept of universal grammar without going into a lot of detail uh, of that basically says that the entire human species possesses this uh, uh, faculty of language or this capability of being able to produce speech and language uh, across the board, but there are certain, there is something uh, referred to as uh, a universal, uh, you know, grammar. This universal grammar is basically the, let us say, blueprint of all the languages that exist and are spoken by humans. The idea is that this universal grammar imbibes the rules or the framework within which any language spoken on the face of this earth will sort of function. So, every language would maybe have a certain kind of uh, word order, will have certain kinds of word categories, nouns, verbs, adverbs, adjectives and so on and basically it is within those rules. Say for example, if you are uh, saying a sentence that, okay, uh, the cat is chasing the mouse, in this sentence there is an agent, there is a patient uh, and there is an action that is happening. So, the idea of universal grammar is that broadly the framework within which these different languages function is pretty much the same, not identical but let us say pretty much very very similar to each other and it is only that the parameters of different languages, say for example their specific characteristics or the way they uh, represent these different concepts, word categories, word order and so on may differ from each other. An example could be that in uh, Hindi, the, uh, the uh, canonical or the typical word order is the subject uh, verb object uh, order. Say, for example, uh, Ram ne uh, Sham ko khana khilaya. So, subject object verb. So, Ram is the subject, Sham is the object, and khana khilaya becomes the verb. Whereas in English, the canonical word order is a subject uh, verb object. Uh, which is basically the cat is chasing the rat. So, the cat is the uh, 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 subject, uh, the uh, verb is the chasing and the rat is the object. So, you can see that there are differences between word order of the two languages, but the idea is irrespective of the word order, they are representing reality in a particular manner. So, this is one of the ideas that you have to be mindful when you are looking at different languages. Also an interesting and slightly older idea was uh, presented by Charles Hockett who sort of who presented uh, what are called the design features of a language. He basically gave uh, 16 features of communication systems and some of which were referred to as the design features uh, which will uh, apply to human languages as well and uh, uh, Hockett proposed that any language spoken on the face of this earth will basically have these specific features that they will adhere to. 
so for example something like semanticity or temporal and spatial displacement uh, or arbitrariness for that matter are some of the design features that would apply to uh, any of the these languages that we are talking about be it english hindi urdu tamil telugu malayalam or russian french uh, chinese japanese and so on there will be some of there will be uh, these design features which will be common to all the languages to this extent what we are saying is while the languages of a bilingual will interact with each other they would the interaction would not be as drastic as to violate some of the basic underlying principles as laid out in chomsky's universal grammar or hockett's design principles of the language now the another uh, this approach basically is referred to the approach that i am sort of uh, referring to just now is referred to as the language universal approach now language universal approach basically says as the uh, you know name suggests that all languages basically would share the same design features they same design features and as i said will work within a certain specified framework now these things or uh, this theory derives uh, heavily from chomsky's uh, idea of an innate language organ that the species has uh, you know uh, inherited uh, through evolution uh, which sort of uh, allows us to learn different languages but the broader framework within which all the languages of the human beings work will pretty much be the same under this approach different languages are in fact different representational systems of the same universal and biologically designed features so the idea is that human language or human speech for that matter uh, is basically a system that is in some sense you could say a closed system although different representations of that are possible as manifested in the different languages of the world there are also uh, a couple of arguments that you know put forward this linguistic diversity uh, uh, you know thing uh, which basically uh, uh, you know try to explain where this linguistic diversity may be stemming from say for example a historical approach about linguistic diversity proposes that as languages evolved maybe as a species we inherited the same framework and so on but as people sort of started traveling away from each other different languages started taking taking different evolutionary routes and as languages is in uh, evolved they over time gradually got differentiated from each other so through various ways say for example the sounds became differentiated the uh, grammatical rules became differentiated uh, the uh, idea as to how speakers in a particular group interact with each other may have influenced the different evolution of uh, of these uh, languages so in some sense although the evolutionary history might be traced to the uh, you know similar instances but obviously languages diverged and got differentiated from each other and through speakers different and also this uh, you know uh, evolution or this diversity sort of uh, comes into play when you talk about creation of new languages say for example when uh, different speaker groups come in contact with each other it also happens that new languages are uh, being created say for example uh, uh, you know speakers of different languages persian and kharibholi uh, uh, you know came together uh, uh, several years ago in in india and a new language called urdu was sort of brought up gradually all right so this kind of uh, understanding of linguistic diversity has uh, uh, you know led to uh, different schemes of classifying these languages and there are uh, three uh, or two or three different types of classification that we can talk about uh, one of them is based on the historical relatedness of languages say for example uh, if you google uh, or you go on wikipedia you will find language trees these language trees trees basically talk about the uh, genetic history or the evolutionary history of these languages as to how they have been related to each other and there are these several language families that you will come across say for example the indo european language families the indo aryan language families or the africo afro asian language families the idea is that all of these language families basically reflect a descent from a common language a very old one uh, which sort of differentiated into different uh, you know branches and different languages it's pretty much if you want to uh, you know take an uh, example is like a river uh, uh, when it starts from its source uh, gradually divides into different tributaries which eventually probably uh, you know which eventually uh, uh, become different rivers and different entities on their own 
Now the other classification that is there is called the typological classification or the typological classification which is based on the similarity of structural features. So different languages might also be similar across the lines of the structural features that they have for example word order, the uh, word categories and so on. And, uh, based on how similarly or how differently they manifest these concepts, these uh, languages can be uh, uh, you know classified as being typologically similar or typologically very different to each other. Another classification that we can talk about is called the aerial classification which is pre, uh, pretty much a geographical classification of the languages which is based upon the geographical closeness and contact between uh, different language speaking communities. For example, the Balkan languages or the uh, Caucasian languages, East Asian languages, South Indian languages and so on and so forth. Although these languages are members of the same you know aerial geographically proximal uh, 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 you know groups of speakers, they may or may not be related genetically to each other, uh, but they have sort of converged in, uh, in history due to prolonged contacts with each other. So it is basically languages that may or may not have evolved through the same language tree, but because the speakers came in contact over and stayed uh, together for a lo longer periods of time, they have become proximally or let us say aerially close to each other. Now another slightly different approach to linguistic diversity relies on paying more attention to differences between human languages uh, rather than their commonalities and it basically focuses on describing how linguistic diversity manifests itself in everyday interactions. Now the idea is when you look at Chomsky's idea of the universal grammar or Hockett's idea of uh, you know design features, we are focusing more on how these languages are similar to each other. But there is obviously some merit in looking at how the different languages are different from each other and how do these differences manifest in uh, speakers linguistic behaviors. Now the proponents of this diversity approach take into account social and political considerations that allow the classification of languages into languages and dialects. Say for example and also you, you will see that in certain regions of the world although uh, you know uh, speakers have been living in contact with each other for longer time but languages or speaker groups strive for a different identity, strive for being differentiated from each other rather than being clubbed into the same group. A very interesting case for example is the Chinese dialects Mandarin and Cantonese. So Mandarin speakers and Cantonese speakers sort of identify different, differently from each other. Now one of the things that we can sort of talk about in this whole debate uh, about language diversity or language commonality is to ponder about uh, the situations where speakers of different languages come in contact with each other and how does this uh, you know speak how does this contact affect their different languages or the languages that they sort of speak. Now when speakers of different languages come into contact with each other uh, as groups or societies or sometimes just as you know a bunch of individuals, uh, there are different aspects of bilingualism or multilingualism that may emerge. Let us look at uh, some of those. Now one of these things is called territorial bilingualism or multilingualism and territorial bilingualism and multilingualism typically happens when groups of speakers of specific languages find themselves within their own ge geographically and politically defined territories. It is almost like saying oh this area is inhabited by speakers of language A whereas a uh, adjoining area is uh, um, uh, you know inhabited by speakers of language B. It is very common in a, in a few countries of the world say for example in Belgium uh, as I said probably in one of the previous lectures that the south of Belgium uh, speaks mainly French whereas the northern uh, cities of Belgium say for example Ghent, Antwerp and Bruges etc. speak mainly Flemish. Similarly in Canada, uh, parts of Canada speak uh, French whereas others speak English. In India also you can see that there are organizations where certain states have their own uh, specific languages whereas others have different languages. Similarly, uh, another phenomena that we could talk about is the phenomena referred to as diglossia where two or uh, more languages are spoken by the same community uh, at the community level but these two languages serve different purposes and serve different uh, sections of the society. 
For example, uh, in, in, in India, uh, we predominantly use, and I am talking mainly of the northern belt uh, uh, because this is where I come from, uh, predominantly use Hindi to talk to each other, but they also, for example, uh, uh, you know, for example, in, in a particular religious group, use Sanskrit for all the, uh, you know, uh, uh, rituals of, uh, 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 you know, worshipping and this and, uh, you know, the other rituals uh, associated with it. So, Sanskrit serves a particular purpose whereas Hindi serves a particular commonplace way of talking and so on. So, in, 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 in a lot of ways it can be seen that there, the two languages coexist in the society but they complement each other with respect to the function that each of them are playing in the framework of the society. Now, there are also instances where parts of the world have what is called widespread multilingualism. In several countries, many different languages are spoken simultaneously within and between groups. For example, and they exist, coexist with each other and uh, are used for wider communication between communities. Say, for example, uh, Spanish uh, and uh, English in, in, in the United States of America, where speakers uh, who have sort of descended from, uh, you know, Mexico and nearby regions uh, speak Spanish uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the Americans uh, speak English. Uh, similarly, uh, similarly, for example, in, in the south of India, uh, you know, uh, if you go, uh, uh, while there are uh, these, uh, you know, different states which have uh, their own languages, so for example, uh, Kannada is spoken in Karnataka, uh, uh, you know, Malayalam is spoken in Kerala, uh, uh, you know, uh, Telugu is spoken in, uh, in uh, uh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh and so on, uh, but there is a lot of intermixing between these languages, Tamil is spoken in Tamil Nadu, uh, there, is, there is a lot of coexistence of languages, if you, if you are in a cosmopolitan city like Bengaluru, uh, you will see that a lot of speakers, uh, although they might be hailing from maybe, a Tam, maybe Tamil Nadu or Kerala or Hyderabad, uh, they would be knowing their own language but would also be, uh, you know, would also have learned to speak in, in Kannada. Uh, for some of their purposes. So, a lot of these languages uh, would coexist and would be used interchangeably because everybody knows all of these languages at the same time. And this is also a source of, uh, you know, uh, linguistic diversity, it is also a, a source of interaction between different languages and it is also a source of, say for example, changes structural or otherwise that come between these languages. Now, one of the other things that we should, uh, you know, probably focus about and talk a little bit about is instances of individual, uh, you know, uh, bilingualism. For instance, different individuals and we, we have been talking about societies and we have talking about groups so far, but different individuals also, if, you know, you focus on the individual as a subject, acquire or learn to speak two or more languages for different reasons. For example, uh, if an individual is born to bilingual parents, you know, the mother speaks a different language, the father speaks a different language, the individual will inevitably be exposed to both languages and learn the two languages. It also happens, say for example, that, uh, you know, for a lot of us who uh, were born in Hindi speaking families, but were sent to English medium instruction schools. So, we picked up one language at home and the other at school almost simultaneously because school starts very early and in that sense that became uh, a factor uh, for us to learn English and uh, continue using it for education and vocation uh, going forward. Similarly, it also happens, say for example, uh, that people migrate, uh, you know, for job or something, uh, for better job prospects, for opportunities, for st higher studies to different countries and they pick up the language of that country that one has gone. So, for example, a lot of people from India go to Russia for, uh, you know, medical uh, uh, studies, so a lot of people go to the United States or other English speaking countries for higher education and job prospects and even though they might not have been using English so much, uh, you know, while they were living in, in different parts of India, they all sort of would pick up and start using English predominantly because that is the uh, language that is spoken at their place of work. Now, uh, there are different factors that would govern uh, how individuals would, uh, you know, pick up languages or say for example, their ability to pick up different languages at the same time. 
factors for example uh, you know uh, biological factors that at the uh, such as the age at which an individual is acquiring a language uh, the working memory capacity the general uh, intelligence the verbal aptitude there are so many of these factors that govern the success or the extent to which a particular individual will be able to learn a language more often than not if you're talking about uh, younger uh, younger children and if everything is fine and the uh, the brain and everything is working normally they would be very successful at uh, you know learning any number of languages sometimes however there might be anomalies which sort of push children uh, you know which sort of make it slightly difficult for them to pick up these languages now uh, in in this sense a biological uh, notion is uh, is there which is referred to as the critical period hypothesis the critical period hypothesis was uh, put forward by lenberg in 1967 and it basically says that there is an ideal period of time uh, within which an individual can acquire a language typically between 3 to 7 years uh, during which time if an individual is not exposed to a linguistically rich environment and is not exposed to a lot of linguistic input then the individual will not be able to learn a language or any language for that matter after that time and again this is more this has more to do with the first language acquisition than the second language because obviously people can learn a second language much after their 7 or 8 years of age but typically or biologically speaking this is pretty much the best time for an individual to, to uh, for an individual to be exposed to the first language obviously but also a second or a third language within this period if individuals are exposed to different languages it is a high chance that they will be able to successfully learn uh, one two three uh, you know a, a number of languages that they are exposed to without any significant delay or without any significant deterioration in the quality of any of these uh, languages that they would learn all right now there are also concerns and there are also discussions about the mental representations of the two languages of the bilingual in the brain as i was saying i know both hindi and english and both of them reside in my brain do they interact with each other do they influence each other do they interfere with each other and these are questions that have been asked by researchers say for example people have wondered and we will discuss them uh, you know in much more detail as we go forward that whether there is a shared or a separate storage of the different aspects of language do the sounds of the two languages that i know uh, stored separately or in a shared manner do the concepts that i have in both the lang in both my languages stay uh, stored uh, separately separately or in a shared manner and these are questions and once we start uh, you know uh, going to comprehension production uh, we will do this in a lot more detail that how is this happening how how are the two languages so to speak stored in our brain and again not really in a, in a physical sense uh, whatsoever also there has been uh, you know uh, a, a lot of discussion about how do we sort of access these languages uh, do is there is there common combined store of orthography as i said is there a common store of phonology that is sounds is there a common conceptual store that all that whichever way we access the conceptual store is the same say for example take the example of an apple whether i call an apple a sabe or an apple uh, i am pretty much talking about the same fruit i am pretty much accessing the same conceptual knowledge that i have about the fruit so it is uh, you know red or green in color so, uh, you know is sweet or sometimes a little sour is found in uh, you know uh, regions of uh, india like himachal pradesh or in california and so on and so forth these are some of the questions that bilinguals have uh, bilingual researchers have wondered a lot about and there is a lot of research about these issues that we will talk about in the following lectures also there has been a bunch of discussion about differences in the speaker's level of proficiency the age at which they have acquired these languages and how these factors moderate the uh, you know the interaction of the languages between the individual i have talked about proficiency in the previous lecture in detail and it is a very interesting and very important variable to be mindful of when we are talking about bilinguals finally uh, a very important consideration when discussing bilingualism and multilingualism is also of as i said uh, in the last lecture is about the speakers the listeners and the environmental setting bilingual speakers or multilingual speakers often uh, you know uh, sort of oscillate between very monolingual modes when they are comfortable speaking only in one language to uh, lose 
bilingual or multilingual mode where if they know that the speaker and the setting allows for speaking uh, uh, you know in either of their known languages you will find that uh, bilingual speakers say for example in informal settings will con will switch on and off into a second or a third language uh, uh, irrespective of uh, uh, basically taking into consideration as to who the uh, audience is and what the setting of the environment is. So you will see phenomena like code switching, code mixing and so on very commonly among bilinguals. So that's all that I wanted to share in today's lecture. I'll see you in another one. Keep following. Thank you.